Great. Okay, they can recall the heart meeting to order up for Missing Carol. But she'll be back. Um, welcome, everyone. Oh. Um, I have, I have uh, four items to add to the agenda for this evening. Under all <laughs> business, uh, we need a stable report. And Carol wanted to talk about the Huffington barn room. Uh, Bob's going to talk about dunes. Oh, yeah. And who's talking about Verna's card collection? Verna. Verna is so good. <laughs> Does anybody have anything else they would like to add to the agenda? Oh, I. So nobody knows. Uh, nobody has anything to add to the agenda. Secretary's report. Did everybody get a chance to look at it? I passed them out if you didn't have it. And, uh, and I sent it online. So. We didn't get a copy. We didn't get a copy? No. no. Oh, we did. Is this it here? Yeah. It's oh, that's a, three pages. Nancy, it was an attachment, and your name is on the email list, but the list did not include an email from Bruce. I looked it up last <coughs> night after you said something. Oh, so it went it, to her? Yes, it went to Nancy. Oh, okay. a couple, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, it was a draft. Obviously, you guys don't share it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It was a dinner table order. Email. I will. Anyone who didn't get it, we will. Do you need a few minutes to look it over? If not, I'll accept the motion to accept. Mine is every day. I move to accept the uh, secretary's report. Bob and Monique. Bob and who? Monique. Monique. Monique Lobby. I'll speak up with that. Treasure is The current balance of the checking account is $21,342.81. Oh, that's different. So for the year, uh, our intake and our outflow is negative $2,300. So it looks like we probably have 10 years of survival before we go like Social Security. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a couple comments. The administrative expenses are $1,900. Uh, 1,600 of that is for the tax filing because our nonprofit is a 16 page tax form. It's a nightmare to fill out. So Peter initiated getting it uh, done by a certified public accountant, which I think is a good idea. Um, right. The post office box rentals $182 and the trailer registrations are $113. That's the only comments I have. Any questions? Nope. You want to take membership payment for next year? Yes, you might gladly get it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and that cash. Cash. Oh, my gosh. Sanders, Sanders, or Sanders. Always nice to see money coming in. Uh, yes. 
that deficit's getting smaller and smaller. That's right. <laughs> 20, $20 at a time. Does anybody want to uh, make a motion to accept? Make a motion to accept the treasury report. Treasury. Anybody? Second. 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 All those in favor? Uh, All right. Old business. Um, Peter and Bob, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about the needs for the Zoom meeting oh, yeah. and what's happening with that. Hey, Peter. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to present your uh, findings on the putting together a much better Zoom situation? Um, yeah, I can, yes. Um, okay. Do you have the floor? Thanks. Uh, what we're doing tonight is a, is a uh, hang on a minute. I got to let somebody in. There we go. Hang, what we're doing tonight is an interim uh, trial. Uh, and I had access on a trial basis at, at the house the other day for a different system that was much better than this. Uh, and this camera and this equipment for the microphones and stuff is borrowed from the woodworkers group. But if we're gonna to continue to do these, and I really would like to, I'm a little disappointed that some of our out of town people are not joining, but, um, uh, and maybe we need to work on that, but the Zoom thing works for a lot of us. And uh, anyway, the camera is about $125, depending literally on the day of the week and the demand. And the microphone setup is about $300. And there's some odds and ends in that, but about $500, give or take, is what it would take. And uh, what we've got going right now is is uh, working pretty good uh, as far as the meeting goes, and and uh, so uh, I I would hope that we could do this. The other issue that I think we need to think about: we're working with Bob's thirteen-year-old laptop, which is struggling at best, and uh, I think it's time that uh, for a whole lot of reasons that the society owns one, one we could be storing some of our data on it. We could use it for these meetings. Um, we could use it for presentations. If somebody wants to do presentations, um, they could be on it. And um, especially the presentations, if, if we came up with a, a, a presentation that, you know, any most, not that some people, different people could pick up and go with, and that was on the laptop. That would be nice. Not having everything dependent on uh, one person, especially if that one person lives, lives 50 miles outside a conference. Um, that's me. So we, we, we need to think about that. But the audio visual for the Zoom, let's say $500. Laptops have come down tremendously in price. I remember buying the first one in 2003 and spending $1,800. Um, today, um, you can buy them literally from $400 and up, and they're, they're not bad at $400. So we can, I would not suggest necessarily that being the price. That's kind of the bottom line, but uh, it's something for us to be thinking about. Anyway, that's what I have to say, um, the any system we use is probably going to benefit from the space that we're in. And this is a better side of that room than when we were in before. Um, just because we're dealing with only a couple of microphones, which is all we really want. And we need to kind of keep it low ceiling and, you know, close it a little bit. So, questions? So Peter, sorry. So Peter, for roughly between a um, thousand and maybe fifteen hundred dollars, we could cover everything. 
I would say definitely yes. And, and there's definitely, I can't emphasize enough, that's Robin, I can't emphasize enough that going forward um, that this format has become um, commonplace in, in business and also in nonprofits such as we got because it has allowed people uh, in fact long areas to participate on an active basis. I mean, tonight, we only have one person from out of state that I know of, but uh, we do have members from Texas and Michigan and Maine and upstate Vermont who sometimes join us. And I anticipate that as we grow, the number of those people will grow. And acting as ringmaster, I can easily handle 25 people on the on the Zoom thing uh, and know who's talking and who's doing what. And we could go even further if we had to, so. And by the way, thank you, Bob, for telling me in advance. May I suggest <laughs> that, that perhaps one of the difficulties right now with the out of state people, especially the Midwestern people, is the time because they're working and at five o'clock is nice here, but it may be three or four o'clock in the afternoon and folks who are at work simply can't come on Zoom. We used to meet at seven o'clock at night. That might be a, you know, a different issue. This time was chosen last month by Tom Prescott and it had to do with traveling in the dark from a distance as some of the people here had done. Just a consideration. Pete, uh, Peter, could you hear her? Just a vote. Carol, say hello. Hello, Peter. Yeah, that microphone isn't working. Uh, Maybe it didn't working. turn it on. It oh. Now, can you hear this, Peter? Yes. You have to hold it close. You have to eat it. <laughs> no, that's true. That's what I said. Uh, uh, Peter, I was just saying that I think perhaps the difficulty this time is the five o'clock in the afternoon on a work day, yes. and the people in the Midwest are at work, and three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon is a difficult time to dis to disengage yourself from your work and go to a Zoom meeting. That could change in the future. One thing that one thing that the uh, Woodworkers Group Board of Directors, which is 14 members, has found that we're all over from Kittery, Maine to up to where we are in Grantham. And uh, we started this a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago. And we used to meet for dinner and then go to the meeting and get out of the meeting at 8.30. And you know what it's like at 8.30 30 is this time of year and then drive home and who knows what the weather's going to be. And we went to Zoom and I don't anticipate going back maybe once or twice in the summertime for a dinner meeting just to meet and say hello. But it has worked out so well for us. We'll see what we're very happy. And the more we do it, and the more people get used to it, they will they will pick up the etiquette that goes with it. So if they want to speak, they'll hold a hand up and be called on that type of thing. But I, I think it's definitely something. Peter, can, Peter, can you hold off a minute? Pat and Bob are trying to do no, something okay. and um, I can't hear you. Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Hi. Okay, Peter, I guess they're finished. But I, I, I agree with Carol and I think moving the meetings back to at least 6.30 is probably a good thing. Hello. Hi. Hi. It is Masha. Yes, hi. <laughs> Peter, would you like to make a motion so then we can discuss it? I As make a motion we spend up to, up to $1,500 to purchase some audio and visual equipment to enable us to do Zoom 
and to purchase a laptop to be used by the society and or its officers to be used in conjunction with Zoom presentations and possibly other uses within the society. I'll second that motion. Can I ask how fundraising has been done in the past for something like that? In the past, Peter has done a number of presentations for us. Um, and that has brought in actually quite a bit of money. Ask the question. I'm sorry, did you hear the question I was asking um, in the past when we wanted to make an expense like this, uh, what type of fundraising we did? Hmm. And I was telling her that you brought us a lot of money here by your presentation. I, I used to do between six and 10 a year. Um, and uh, uh, the price average probably in, in later years, I, I think I charged a hundred dollars. Um, and uh, um, all the money went to the all, all the money went back to the society. Sometimes I got a little stipend for travel if I had to go all the way to Conway or something like that, but I normally kept none of it. Um, I think that as we as, as a museum gets to be constructed and um, we're open that the more we can go out into the public and push our message, the more people are gonna come and it will continue to grow upon itself. Thank you. Um, we got uh, $1,500 from New Hampshire Gibbs. Right. Thea convinced us to join that. Or it cost us fifty dollars only to join. So. Was that yeah. And occasionally, when we've taken the uh, coach to different activities around New Hampshire, um, we have been reimbursed. I did one of those. <laughs> and we got a thousand dollars from Steve Degree for Patrick moving his coach. Right. Conway to you and Dave. Okay, give Dave credit to <laughs> Pat and Dave. If we have pregnant pauses, it's because I'm writing. I would like to just comment that I think that the decrease in income is because of the COVID cl close down. And having had that lifted and we get back in business again in the spring, I think everything will pick up again. It's, it was only because of COVID that the income stream was ceased, stopped. Any more questions or discussion? Okay. Yeah. Second the motion. First the motion. I second. Yeah, whatever. I second it. Okay. So, um, would you like to vote on it? All mm -hmm. those in favor? Uh, Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? Okay. We've got it, Peter. Hey, if I needed something else to do in my spare time. Right. <laughs> so, so, Peter, I, I assume that you're going to find all this material for us. I hope so. And Bob will bring you a check. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, yeah, I know the drill. <laughs> <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. That's right. Okay. Um, Carol has had some correspondence from Soloway uh, and Attorney Best. And Carol, do you want to address what it is that they um, would like and what they would like us to do? One of the afterthoughts of our initial meeting with the city, which was with the development director, the manager, and the city attorney 
um, in preparation for our ongoing development of the stable was that we all, since they are represented by council, that we also be represented by council. And through the kindness of Richard Woodfin, the marketing manager at the Sullivan Law Firm, um, he, we asked uh, for help from Sullivan. We asked for a pro bono lawyer and they responded that the, law, the firm would be very happy to provide us with pro bono, uh, pro provide Abbott Downing Historical Society with pro bono counsel. And Mr. Robert Best, attorney Robert B-E-S-T, is the pro bono counsel of the Abbott Downing Historical Society. We met with Mr. Best, um, David, Irwin, Esther, Carol, and help me, there was somebody else. It's almost there. And Tom Prescott. I yes, I'm sorry. No, Esther. I wasn't there. Oh, you were the other one. The, and Tom Prescott. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Best asked for information, uh, uh, background information about the Historical Society, including articles of incorporation and bylaws and um, directors and officers lists and so forth, which have been provided to him, thanks to Peter James and Esther Crowley. And, um, and he would, is very anxious to be with us at future meetings when anything about the stable is being discussed. The law firm will provide the council at no charge, incidental expenses, including secretarial time or postage, so forth, uh, would be charged on a monthly basis. And we would receive an invoice in a month when there was a charge and the treasurer would pay it, which we agreed. Mr. Best made um, suggestions about going forward. Principally, he asked if we had DNO insurance, directors and officers insurance, which we do not. We had a discussion about the New Hampshire RSA regarding DNO liability as long as the, as the people involved do not accept any money in payment for their services, which was the RSA in the past. Mr. Best said that he would research that and would uh, report back to us at the next meeting, which has not yet taken place. But anyway, if we need any help right now, we can go to the Sullivan Law Firm and, and they're right there. And we're very grateful to them. Perhaps um, there should be, a, I would like to suggest that a letter be written by the corresponding secretary to the law firm. That's Evelyn Sheehan, uh, uh, requesting I would request that that letter be sent thanking the law firm Soloway, Soloway and Hollis in their official name and Mr. Best for their support of our activities. That's not okay. a motion, it's just a suggestion. Okay, Carol. <laughs> Carol. Well, thank, you. Right there. No, Carol. thank you, Evelyn. Carol, this yeah. is Peter. Uh, and Mr. Vess is actually on listening tonight. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. I didn't know that. I wouldn't have spoken for you. I apologize, sir. It was okay. I was distracted during that part of the meeting when you were speaking for me anyway. So. Okay. Well, then you better say it yourself, please. <laughs> what did you need me to say? I especially referenced your encouraging us to to get VNO insurance and you're checking out the RSA about its necessity. Yes, absolutely so. Um, it's always, insurance is better liability than, than organizational structures, um, but we'll get you the, the exact information on that, so. Thank you.
That's it? Yes. Okay. Um, the move of materials are historical and archival material from Patricia, her, from her basement. Uh, is Patricia on? Would she like to talk about that? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> no, okay, Hi, no. Patricia, did you want to talk about the move from the um, from the basement of your home? The, I can uh, just home I can make a quick comment because Carol Began is the one who organized it all and facilitated it, and I thought it went very smoothly. Um, I was rather appalled to find when we, my family moved most of the materials up to my garage before they were taken away. And as I looked at what was there, I realized that I had fallen far behind in keeping records of what donations had been given to the society and, um, the uh, contents of the guide, which I started when I first became the archivist. So uh, as a result, I have kept uh, some materials here and I plan to work on those over the winter so I can catch up on where we should be, uh, particularly with the guide so that when anybody wants to find information on any aspect of Abbott Downing, uh, they'll have a reference book to go to to uh, try to determine where those might be. But I want to thank everybody who participated in it. It was a um, master turnout of movers, as Carol can tell you. And that all seemed to go very smoothly. And I think we're all feeling much better now that the materials are in a secure storage area which is truly climate controlled and uh, will be safe there at least through the winter. Um, and we can get back to looking at them and working with them again in the spring. That is Dr. Malik. Everything on our end went really smooth. And um, Carol did a great job of getting the team together to do all that. And uh, it was, just like you said, many hands make light work. It all works smooth and went well. Thank you for all your support. Carol, did you want to add anything? I believe that Pat, also, Pat uh, Patricia also asked for assistance um, with archival work. And now I pass the microphone to Monique Lobby, who um, expressed great interest. <laughs> Don't match <pressure> to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, Patricia, I would very much like to spend some time working with you. I can um, be coming from Manchester and I am working two jobs at present, um, but, you know, possibly a couple nights a week. If there's something that I can do to meet with you and help you out, um, I would love to do that. That's the best Christmas present I could get. <laughs> that makes me really happy. Um, so I will pass along my personal information to you and you can contact me for what works. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. I look forward to working with you. Thank you. And we also have to thank Patrick for organizing the move and being, move and being the leader of the 13 people who showed up on a weekday at noontime, actually got there earlier than the appointed hour and made everything go very smoothly. But thank you to Patrick for that. Thank you. Okay. Stable update. David, uh, Carol? Um, on my end, I work with um, Matt Walsh from the city and Jay Burgess, who is head of public works over there for access to the stables. Um, I have since met with a um, hazardous materials in a vacant contractor over there. Um, we walked through the building. We 
kind of decided that we're going to send back a testing company and do um, about another 10 different samples. We're kind of just going to push back on some of the results that were in the state report. Um, <clears throat> just out of ex experience, none of us have come across what they're talking about in the report. So we're just going to push back a little bit on that. <laughs> And then he's going to start putting numbers to go against the GZA report, which he thinks is vastly inflated. So good news on those on those ends. Great. <laughs> Are we, are we recording the Zoom? There is the capacity to do that. <coughs> I, I don't know anything about Zoom, so. Peter, do you know are we recording these Zoom meetings? Yes, the meeting is being recorded. Oh. Oh, okay. that helps. <laughs> it, oh. it will be on YouTube for everybody to see next week. YouTube. Uh, okay, oh, there you go. That helps a lot. I'll probably have to call you to figure out how to get to YouTube. If okay. anyone has a voice remote, you just push the microphone and say, show me Abbott Downing Historical Society on YouTube, and it should bring you right to it. Oh, good. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> now i got to watch my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> really appreciate that. Um, Hawkington Barnes. Any update? Yeah. Oh, tell about it. Um, gosh, uh, well, Evelyn sent out thank yous to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank I you. don't, because um, I have a small memory. I don't remember everything that went on, but I know um, everybody that worked and helped worked really hard and unfortunately we wore them out so people were dropping every day <laughs> on us and um i think the last three survivors was tom prescott myself and actually four um clark <coughs> sandy sims um, and unfortunately clark and sandy sims got the dirty job of cleaning those barns Oh, but there were troopers. They uh, they came through. Um, there's a few things left in the barn. Um, we'll deal with it at another time. And obviously, we've got to deal with the barn at some point. But that's all I can say about. It. Anybody else got anything? But it went well. Wow. It went really well. Um, it was hard, but it mm. went well. 15 people, three days. Yeah, last time I saw it, it was really cool. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. One cross finger. Oh, oh. Yeah, David got hurt. Oh, oh. I think I helped him with that. Oh. <laughs> um, is there any news on what's happening with the barn itself? Peter, do you know anything about the park? No, I, I have not been involved at all. Um, the last I knew, which is uh, nine months ago, maybe, uh, you know, they were hedging uh, their bet on it. Uh, uh, Peter, I think, I think uh, this winter we. We can still get in there, and somebody should get in and take some good photographs inside the van, and then um, we should put the word out that it's available. Or we should give the fairgrounds a, a notice that says uh, either you want it or we're going to get rid of it. And uh, it would be nice if they just take it, but I suspect they're going to not. And uh, we're going to have to find somebody that will take it. And then uh, the deal is they can have 
the vines are free, but they got to clean it up afterwards, including the concrete slab. We suggested they use the concrete slab for motorcycle parking, which seemed to be a win-win because the guys come in there with their bikes and they'll leave them on the grass and, you know, it's not very stable. I would think they'd love to have that concrete pad, but uh, whatever. And uh, maybe the fairgrounds will take it, maybe not, but I think we've got to decide what we're going to do and make it happen. Tom Prescott, um, he knows somebody who might be interested in the barn. So until uh, we hear from Tom, I'll try to reach out to him or somebody needs to reach out to him and see if, um, see if we can get anything done on that on his end. The gentleman that was building an overhead um, enclosure for his trucks expressed an interest in that barn. Wow. So that that's an avenue too. Hey Peter. Yes. Um, in the treasury files, I found uh, correspondence with the town of Hopkinton regarding the taxes for that. Yes, we file every year. When when is that filed? In the spring. That's a New Hampshire. Well, it used to be New Hampshire uh, uh, eleven and twelve, I believe, is the phone number, and uh, uh, it goes to the town, uh, and they like to have that form plus a copy of the form that goes to the charitable trust, which. We get we can get that form from the charitable trust from Kelly, the the CPA. Okay. We should have a copy anyway, but um, so that that kind of covers us as being we we should file every you have to file every year or should, and then the the, the other documentation is just backed up on the fact that we're a nonprofit. Okay, and that that is in the spring. Um, by May 15th, I believe. Four and a half months. We don't pay tax on that barn, do we? We do not pay tax on the barn. Good. Uh, and that document is what, what stops the tax. All right. Thank you. I may have what Peter gave me to file when I was. Oh, okay. If I do, I'll get it to it. I think so it'll give you an idea of what there's it is. a folder in the box. That um, yeah, because I think you have to have the lot number and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And I believe that I have that. Bob? Yes. Uh, normally, what I do is take the same form, change the date on it, send it in. That's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> For Bob, I use an online program, a screen called PDF Escape, which allows you to edit the forms. And uh, so it, I, I can send you the link to that or anybody else that's interested. And uh, uh, then you just need to get that documentation that we file with the uh, charitable trust people and you're, you're good. And in fact, normally I, I, I filed the form with the town earlier uh, and I told them that the other form will be along. Uh, it probably didn't come along this year, but it has in the past. So, uh, and uh, that's fine. I just sent them a letter and say, here's the form and, and we're looking for the rest of the stuff and we'll send it to you when we get it. Yep, okay, good, thanks. Any other old business anybody wants yeah. to tell? A secondary, a secondary note uh, on the barn. Uh, we also had a meeting as requested by the city with the uh, New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. And uh, we met with Jennifer Goodman and who is the head of it, the executive director and Andrew Cushing, 
who is their community person. And both of them, speaking about the barn, suggested that if we wanted to find a buyer for it, that we speak with Beverly Thomas, who is their the barn expert in the clearinghouse of New Hampshire barns at the Preservation Alliance. So if Tom's, if the Hopkinton people, Hopkinton Fair doesn't want the barn and it doesn't go to Tom Prescott's contact, then the next name on the list might be Beverly Thomas at the Preservation Alliance. I'd like to add to that actually. I'm gonna to add to that. I follow a lot of these preservation groups um, and there are a lot of people out there that would be looking for something like this. It would really be a shame to do a tear down. I'd rather give it to someone that we know or make some revenue for the association um, and not just have it scrapped. I do see a lot of people out there that are taking down old barns right now. They'll come and do it for free and then they scrap it, they resell it to um, salvage people who make a lot of money on this stuff. So I would caution, you know, just trying to unload it as fast as possible and really look at all our options um, to have someone purchase it and save it. Yeah. The, the issue of money, and, and I agree, we, we got estimates to what the frame itself is worth. Mm -hmm. The problem is the concrete slab has to be taken up, broken up, and disposed of as hazardous waste. And so that created a huge expense. Right, and I understand that. Uh, I'm going to just take the liberty of um, keeping a list in the next couple months of people that I see on some of these sites as potential contacts. And I'm not sure that they wouldn't do that. If they're making enough money on the barn itself, I don't think that they would not do the slab. Good. So let me just keep my ears and eyes open and I will let you know on any leads, okay? That's great. Great, thank you. New business. Um, do we have anything scheduled for 2023 that anybody knows? <laughs> Tom said he would have his open house again this year. Tom Prescott mentioned that his that he is hoping planning to have his um, museum open house again. This year, that's in June, usually, Patrick, I believe. Yeah. Monique, do you want to go with me to the barn someday and take pictures? I would love to go to the barn. <laughs> Good. Um, pretty much trying to tell me that. I would love to go to the barn with you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Well, you need me because I get the key to get in. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Need the key. What would be my purpose at the barn? To take the pictures. Oh, I thought you were going to try to. If you're going to contact these people, I'm not going to contact. People, oh, okay. right, because you guys yeah, have some mind. things you know, in the works that I I don't want to mess with right now. I'm okay. going to keep a list of people that I see out there that are looking that do these types of jobs, that kind of thing, and present it. Okay. But it might be. I, I don't for you to see them. Yeah. Oh, I, I've seen the barn. Oh, I mean, okay. I've studied yeah, no, that. She, <laughs> no, I love the there's barn. There's no reason for you to go there. Okay. Uh, I, I, I didn't know. Uh, I'll do pictures. Oh, yeah, it's, it's so close to my house. So, and you have it. Yeah, I just have to find it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, get together with me. You go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so yes, it's because uh, we should have some recent pictures of barn to try to move it. Yep. Outside and inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you already spoke about dues. No. Okay. Would you like to talk about dues? Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we've collected three hundred and fifty dollars worth of dues so far. Uh, 
And I got this nice note with one of these. The rest of them were just checks. This is from Phil Warren. And he says, Abbott Downing, keep up the excellent work. So, very nice of him. But it is due, right? It due, is due. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm going to hold off on Vernon's card collection because I wanted to bring up something um, I had mentioned to Peter. Um, and Peter had a really good suggestion that <clears throat> what um, I was concerned about was that we don't, we made a motion and, and carried it at our last meeting that our wagons would not be hitched up to horses and driven, but it's not written anywhere. And I was thinking in terms of maybe making some kind of an amendment to our uh, bylaws and Peter had a good point. He said, every time you change the bylaws, you have to resubmit it again to all of your stuff. But if you write a policy, you can change policies, you can keep it, nobody cares about them. So I guess I had a question, one, do we have some kind of a policy manual? And if we don't, um, are people feeling that maybe we should have one so that we do have a record of, for instance, not hooking the coaches up, so that nobody gets put in the position that Pat's in, that he can simply say, I'm sorry, it's a written policy. Mr. Best. Oh. Yeah. I am here. What I like having say? written policies. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yes. Possibly we could have one policy that said policy of regular relative to demonstration and use of coaches. And so it would be only the repro does this and this and this and this, and no, no coaches are hooked to horses. Okay, school. how did you start that off, Peter? Know what? I knew you were gonna ask. <laughs> I would say <laughs> policy, policy relative to the demonstration and display of coaches. Okay. Are there other things that we should have? Yeah, I would say I would say definitely relative to the originals and definitely relative to the reproduction. And for instance, the stairs that go to the reproduction, you know, people, all of this kind of stuff could be in there. And okay. Yeah, because we voted that none of the historic coach would travel. Right. Yeah, they don't they don't go out on display and they don't get they don't get I mean if, if somebody's coming to look at them, they have to look at them close. <coughs> um should we have maybe two or three people who would be willing to work on um, some policies, I, I will help. Um, Mr. Best. Mr. Best, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> I'd be glad to help you work on policies. Um, I don't know if there's others that might people might think are subjects for which we should have some policies. <laughs> Um, from a legal standpoint, I can think that organizations want to have a conflict of interest policy um, and then bylaws, but bylaws cover a lot. So um, what else? Are there other subjects? Do you guys want to have a policy committee? I'm, I'm thinking, uh, um, do we need one on, on dues so that, you know, at times, I think twice since I belong to the organization, organization, uh, things have changed around becoming a um, long-term member. I can't think of the word right now. Life, life member, member, thank you. <laughs> life member, that kind of thing. Is that something that should be put into a policy in terms of um, uh, how much it is so that we don't have to, you know, so we have something in writing? Yes, um, yes, that's, and, a, that's a good one, Esther, because 
the bylaws now, the dues are now in the bylaws, and, and you could take that out of the bylaws and just say the changes in the dues are subject to vote by the um, membership at a general meeting, for instance. And then, uh, uh, and then the dues are in a policy that says the dues are whatever. So again, you can change them without having to change the bylaws. That, that would be good. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, you want to have that idea of what, the, how much the dues are, and when you have to pay, and what happens if you don't pay. You want all those things written somewhere. Um, a policy could be a place where it is. It could also be in the bylaws. It could be um, if it's something that changes every year. It could be in the minutes of the annual meeting. But one way or another. Um, yeah, that's a that's a item you want to have in writing. Um, another question that comes to my mind relates back to many years ago when I first joined the, the uh, organization. And I'm wondering if we should have some kind of a policy regarding um, if if the board needed to go into executive session to um, try and avert problems. I, I don't know how to put this exactly, but um, it's hard to explain. Carol, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. <laughs> I think we saw the movie together. Yeah, so we just don't want to have it. <laughs> yeah, so let me interrupt one more time. I sure. would, I would make a suggestion that if you and and uh, Bob Best and whoever else you decide you want to get in to do this and have a uh, a committee meeting to do these policies, I'd be glad to host that meeting. That oh, that would be great. So you'll be on the committee, Peter, I hope. <laughs> yes. You just yeah, you, you volunteered your yeah, premises, you, you, so I'm saying they're you're pulling on you the back table. in, Peter. <laughs> it's all and told. They're pulling you back in. Anybody else like to be on that committee? I'll be on. Patrick, great. Okay. Do we need to vote on this? For a committee? No. No, no, okay. No, but who's on the committee? It's it's not gonna be just Peter, you, you, you it's, me. It's you, me, Mr. Best, Peter, and anybody that is interested should jump forward. He's looking at you. David. David. No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> no, we're confusing. Carol? No. Um, Sheila? Well, um, Sheila, okay. Not to exclude anybody, but we don't need to make this a committee as a whole. Right. right. <laughs> okay, that's good. I'm happy with that. Uh, Verna there, she, would she like to talk about her card collection, which is really outstanding. Turn it around so she can see what's yep. We're going to turn the camera so Verna can see it. The card collection began uh, some years ago when uh, Chuck Bobo had a, had a display of some Christmas cards that were, uh, they all came from the 30s. Uh, you can see from the envelopes that were with them that they came, the, the dates that were on them. Um, he was an antiques dealer uh, some of the time. And I saw that collection he had. And after a while, I was uh, able to convince him to sell them to me. And he didn't want to part with them right away. <laughs> <laughs> while I got them, and uh, then I began to add to the collection by um, letting people know that I would like to have some more, and some of them came in Christmas time, and some of them I searched out on the internet, 
and it's really nothing very profound about it. It's just <coughs> that I had fun doing. And there they are. There's nothing that's really uh, conquered coach uh, specific about them, but they're all coaches of one type or another on Christmas cards. Beautiful. Great job. Yeah, really nice. Thank you. Thank you for sharing them. Patricia Andrews and her sister, Sue Thomas, who are very kindly editing the newsletter now, uh, are going to have a show of these cards in the next newsletter, which will come before Christmas. And, and Pat uh, Andrews and, wor um, and worked with Sue Thomas to select these and set them up in protective uh, folders and got the easel so they could be displayed safely. People could pick them up and look at them safely. And they scanned them for the newsletter and they were brought over uh, and set up today by Kathy Kaplan, uh, Patricia's niece who arranged this display for us. So thank you to Verna and to Patricia and Sue and Kathy and everybody who helped with that. You're welcome. Very nice. <clears throat> Are you able to hear um, what Carol was saying? Oh. Can I hear what she said? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, unless anybody has any more questions, we can move on to selecting the time for the next meeting. I actually have one item, if I may. Sure. Sure. It's, a, it's a new business. It's a new business item. This is Robin Briscoe, even though it says oh, Rick Robin. Hi, Robin. Hello. Oh, Robin. Hello. Hold on. Hi. I can uh, do my video, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, it probably won't let me. Um, my question is, is a number of years ago, we ran into a problem with the um, Conquer Coach Society name being acquired by another entity. Um, has there been any looking into seeing if the Concord Coach Society name is back in public domain or still being held by a private person? I, I can answer that. I can answer that, Robin. Um, that other person has uh, each five years when it comes to uh, file the necessary paperwork to keep it in his possession. Um, one of these days, um, he may not be able to, and at that point, uh, I would certainly hope that we got it back. But right now, it's tied up. It's still it's still in his possession. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. It's something that keeps um nagging at me. It, it does me, and uh, I checked the Everybody interesting else. thing. That, Everybody else. The, the interesting thing is that they reports that we have to file every five years and all is online with the Secretary of State's office. The annual reports, which we have to file, by the way, and have notarized for the charitable trust unit, is not online. And so we really don't know what what's happening with that name other than we spend 25 then, then somebody spends $25 every five years to keep the name. Um, he may be using it for fundraising, claiming he's a 501c3. He may be using it for fundraising to do who knows what, or he may just be keeping it uh, as a vindictive move. Okay. Yeah, I would. I, I vote for C. <laughs> oh. I can add a little bit to that puzzle. Um, the last report was filed in 2020, which is good until 2025. Right. Um, so if you're watching the calendar market for 2025, that'll be the next occasion to check again. The other thing that I can do is um, there's a website to look up 
uh, the tax forms that nonprofits file, and I can see if he's filed any. And I'll do that while you guys are continuing with your meeting. Hmm. Oh. Thank you so much. He has to file, he has to file a 990 with, that, with the AG. I can drop my calendar. Does anybody have a calendar so that we set our next meeting date? Oh. Does anybody feel that we need to have a meeting in January? Do we need to have one every month? Can we go maybe to February or? I can't remember what the Bible is. So, I'll walk in the next year. Can we skip on February? We can hear everybody but you. Skip to February? He can hear everybody but me. Is he kidding? Are you kidding? Nobody else says that. Oh. <laughs> well, I was looking in the bylaws to see how often we how often we have to. We're still on paper. Oh my god. I am. Yep, I have to. <laughs> Mm -hmm. This is one person. Uh, well, like the, the yes. only thing it says here is there shall be at least six meetings of the board annually. So, I mean, we can. So, that's every other month. Yeah. Well, it's, it doesn't have to be every other month. It just has to be six yeah. times. So, if we have it, I mean, our activities tend to be more in the spring and summer. Mm. So, we could conceivably skip January and February and go to March mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, have March, June, July or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Everybody seems to be smiling. So as, as long as there's a <laughs> so, newsletter, so. Patricia, <clears throat> what say you to a newsletter on, on what basis? I didn't hear what you were talking about. Sorry. No. A date for a meeting? Yes, what we're trying to do, Patricia, because of the weather and people traveling, um, is to skip January and February and make our next meeting in March. But in order to do that, it would be nice to have a newsletter in there uh, in January or February so that we can kind of keep in touch with people. Is that a possibility? I think so. You're saying a potential newsletter in either January or February? Yeah. Yes, we can do that. Okay, that would be great. Then we can move our next meeting to March. Beginning of March. Hmm? Beginning of March. Yeah. First week. Well, usually it's, it's the first or the second hmm. Monday. So the first Monday in March is the 6th. Whether we want to move oh, oh, the time frame back for other people. Yeah, we can have a birthday. Yeah. For birthday. people who are working that can. Yes. Yeah, I think we should. Could we move it to like the second Monday of the month? I've had to miss two conservation meetings. Mm -hmm which I'm very active on in Loudoun, and um, if it wasn't on the first Monday of the month, maybe We could make it the 13th, which is the second Monday that of the month. That would help me, but it's only me. Or, or make it a Sunday it afternoon. Doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. Um, well, the friends usually meet on a Sunday, so I don't know how Only often. four times a year. Okay. So we could do either the 12th, which is a Sunday, and do it in the afternoon, um, or we could do it the 13th, which is uh, the Monday, the second Monday, and have Monday. it at... Monday's better. Monday's better, Monday. better? okay. So our Monday's next meeting better. will be, is five o'clock a good time for people? No, no not for the Zoom. Okay, so, okay. so 
Our next meeting will be Monday. How about 6.30? Yeah, that's, that's three thirty, though, for people like Tom Little or Margaret Mortimer, who is in Utah. Tom Little is in Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, three thirty. Well, are they there? Are they working? Are they retired? I don't know. They are retired. We had an email from. Hope so. From Nancy. Esther, why are you figuring that? Could I just say please that we had well, an email today from Margaret Mortimer saying that she was sorry she couldn't be at the meeting today because she caught some kind of a bug from her grand boy who was visiting. But the, the Concord Coach posters from the 1980s have just arrived from Margaret Mortimer in a big box of ephemera and <coughs> and um, uh, prints and papers. And she has another project going. She has a lot of black and white line drawings connected to coach effects. And she is going to, she's making a coloring book in anticipation of a gift shop in the, in the future. That's cool. And it is all, and to figure out whether or not it was possible, uh, we connected her with John Lovejoy at Capital Copy. And that's, cooking right along. But we have received 13 boxes of books, which were inventory. Merwin and Esther went through those books and they're all checked out and dated and now carefully stored. And also maybe eight boxes of files and other information. We're still waiting for her to. She has all of the slides which have been talked about for years huh? in the organization, and nobody knew where they were. And she has them, and she said she used them for presentations, but she didn't have a write up to go with them because she just shows the slides and talks. So um, the last time Carol spoke with her, she was going to try and look at the slides and write down, you know, points of interest or whatever. Or she just made an audio. Yeah, she didn't. She, yeah, she could do yeah, that too, she but that. she has nothing at this point except the slides. Huh. Patrick, I have a little recording machine and I offered to send it to her so she could show her slides and uh, talk her piece. So far, she hasn't responded to that. We're trying. Yeah, trying. We should get back to the time frame for the next meeting. Yes, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. So, five o'clock is definitely or? too early. Yep. I agree yeah, with that. Five. It interferes with my dog's habits. <laughs> six thirty. Six thirty. Um, that's what I said. Six thirty, yeah. but that didn't go over. Oh, well, I. Time for us. Six thirty for us. Can we do it tentative and check with the people that are away and see if they can make it? Because you said you thought there were three. Justin can. I'm sure we don't know. Um, so shall we tentatively set it for 6.30? Sure. On the 13th? Yes. Where are you going to meet? Um, we can probably book it for here. This, it, there's parking available and there's, yeah. you know, it's a nice space. Okay. If there is no other business, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Before you adjourn, I can give you the information on Concord oh, Coach, oh, if you yeah. like. Oh, yes. um, it looks like they're not doing anything. It looks like they're dormant. Um, they uh, file a Form 990 dash n which is the postcard style 990 and all you have to do to do that is check the box that your receipts are not greater than fifty thousand um, dollars and so there's not really any more detailed information than that about them other than they filed them in 19 20 and 21 and check that box um, the reason why it looks like it's more dormant than that is that they were also um, on the auto revocation list in 2018 for not filing their tax forms. 
um and then they got reinstated after that and it looks like they just got caught up with a bunch of things so um it looks like this fellow george roberts is the one that runs the thing and um there's there's no no activity okay so if there's nothing else i will now uh entertain nancy's motion to adjourn and i hope people who haven't had an opportunity will go over and look at the cards they're really quite beautiful and i second good night all good night, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.